all. Farmer Jesse here. We have a super special surprise no-till market garden podcast episode for you this week. I hopped on the phone with Mikey Densham, previously of Mossy Willow down in Australia, where he farmed with his partner Kez for many years. They have since moved on. And so we chatted about what Mikey has been up to. We talk about the farm scene in Israel where they currently are. Uh, we talk about tools and employee management and a whole bunch else. And Mikey and I discuss a new collaboration between he and no-till growers. So I hope you enjoy this episode and the project that we have put together that will ultimately serve as a little appetizer for season four of the No-Till Market Garden podcast. First, before we get going, make sure you are subscribed to this podcast wherever you are getting it. Also, maybe you have heard or maybe you have not heard, but my book, The Living Soil Handbook, is officially on shelves in the United States and Canada and will be available in the UK and Europe in the next couple of weeks. However, for those of you in the US, if you buy the book from notillgrowers.com, the proceeds from that sale go to making more content like this podcast, like the Collaborative Farming podcast that just wrapped up its first season with host Jackson Roulette. We also do the No-Till Flowers podcast with Jenny Love, uh, the Winter Growers podcast with Clara Coleman, Growers Live with Josh Satin and videos and all sorts of other stuff. So you can buy a book and support that work. Win-win. This is also not a sponsored episode, but it was brought to you in part by our amazing Patreon members and also in part by a grant through Southern Sayer. All right, enough from me for now. Let's get into this amazing conversation with our buddy, Mikey Densham. Mikey Densham, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks, mate. Thanks for having me on. And it's super excited to have you back. So the the audience may know you and remember you and Kez from your time at Mossy Willow, um, but you've since left. So maybe you can catch us up a little bit about what you've been up to since we last spoke uh, for the, I think it was the first episode of season two. Yeah. So after after working the farm for a good four plus years and it was, you know, we had an, an amazing time. It was uh lived on site and built a really strong business. And I think one of the, one of the most amazing things, which I think, you know, we hear from a lot of farmers is obviously, um, the relationships in our team was just absolutely sharp as sharp as anything. So built a really strong tight knit community around us. Um, but yeah, we ended up moving on from the farm. We had some difficulties with, with the landowners. Um, and, and I think I, we learned a huge amount out of that process. And I think it's kind of also shaped, quite a bit about where I've taken things from now and kind of my interests. Um, and that's largely kind of the challenges of being a tenant farmer and not owning the land, not having long-term security and kind of, I think most farmers have a desire for creating those deep land stewardship and that care for place. And I think that sense of belonging comes with security. And I'm not saying that land ownership is the only thing, but for us, not owning the land was very difficult. And since then, um, I guess, I think since then it's been a kind of a real guiding force in driving a lot of the stuff that I'm looking into and exploring over the last, um, the last six months. I'm curious, I think about that idea of being a tenant farmer and how, you know, to protect yourself and your, your interests and make sure that you're not going to be pushed out of a place. Like, do you have any thoughts or tips or ideas about that? I think it's a massive, it's a massive topic to unpack and I won't, I won't dive into too many details of our specific scenario, but I think since, since moving on and thinking about it, I think obviously is being, I think clarity is an incredibly important thing. Clarity of positions where people stand in terms of a relationship. I think looking into, um, having a strong paper trail, um, of conversations and expectations um, we had a really, I've got a, a really, um, a really good friend and mentor, Dan Palmer, um, who actually has his own podcast, which I recommend people listening to called making permaculture stronger. He does some incredible work with, um, holistic decision-making, holistic management. And I think that was a tool that something that came up quite strongly in terms of understanding and having a, a, a real clear context and clarity around you, your life, your farm, and what you want to get out of it. And clear is kind. Um, it's something which I learned quite deeply as a lesson. And that's something which I'm, I'm now sharing that with others as I go along that I think 
leasing and renting land has a massive role to play, obviously, in the small-scale farming movement and across all farming. But I would really like to see um, a lot more young farmers in situations and scenarios where they are better supported, they have stronger leases, and they have more protection and long-term stewardship. And I think that's that's a part of the reason why you know the work that Jackson's doing in the Collaborative Farming Podcast is so important because it's exploring possibilities of stewardship and partnerships, which I think are much more um, – in terms of the power structure, they're a lot more um, symmetrical. I think there's a lot of asymmetry that comes into land ownership, certainly when um, obviously there's a lot of wealth that could be involved in that. So I think collaboration is going to be, and as it is, becoming a huge topic of exploration because it really needs to be a driving force into keeping young farmers empowered and on land into the future. I love that clear as kind. I mean, one of the biggest things that comes up in that podcast or just in conversations when you're thinking about or talking about collaborative farming is that idea of communication and how it's the most important thing. But if it's not taken seriously, like that can lead to, uh, you know, failure in that in that specific business. Completely. And I think one of the biggest lessons in clarity was actually having self-clarity. It's not only about being being heard, but it's actually being self-aware and I think often we do a lot of things in our businesses in our personal life which we haven't sat down and fully reflected upon not just reflected upon once but really chewed on it and let it let it digest feel how it goes with you and then and you know write it down some people kind of get a bit bit weird about writing sometimes your feelings and emotions down but when you put things on paper, there's there's a real clarity that comes out, which enables you when you are in communication, either with friends or farmers or with a landlord or a business person you might be going into partnership with, you come in with a really strong and a powerful position because you know where you stand and you know your borders of where you're willing to compromise or bend. Um, and that's that's really empowering. That's really special. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I so talk a little bit. What followed Mossy Willow then? What was your next step there? So I think as every farmer wants to do after they've just farmed for a good couple of years, putting in the hard yards is just putting your feet up, <laughs> which is definitely what I did. I kind of I put my feet up for a while and kind of was just trying to find out who Mikey was outside of that kind of Mikey the production farmer. So you know, I definitely I spent some good time kind of investing in in friends in myself health, body, eating, sleeping, fitness, things that I really wanted to do but sometimes couldn't explore to the nth degree. But on the side of that, you know, I, I also wanted to start exploring the different sides of agriculture, so taking a breather from that purely production side and stepping into different realms of the sector because there are some really exciting places in the agricultural sector which a lot of us production farmers, obviously, because we're in our day-to-day of, you know, growing, producing, selling that we don't necessarily – explore and that's you know there's there's community there's community organizations out there there's consulting opportunities um there are education opportunities training so i really wanted to kind of put my my fingers into some of those pies and see how being a production farm would influence me in those spaces and then also what could i take out of those experiences and then bring into my production farming for my future endeavors which i hope to do in the in the near future so um, yeah, so I, I took up a few consulting jobs, which were really exciting, enabled me to have a different perspective of, you know, exploring setup costs for farms, efficiencies and plannings, um, which was really exciting. Um, and also I was at the same time, some of our, our good friends and farmers, so colleagues who farmed with us in Mossy Willow had also moved on after the farm and, um, started their own farming operations. So, you know, checking with them, seeing how they were farming, following their journeys along, we had, Jane Kim, who started Into the Roots, so a really small no-till farm in the hills doing some incredible stuff. Charlotte went and started doing urban farming, started a you know, farm raiser, which was an amazing project in Melbourne City. We had Jess, who was farming with us and flew to the other side of the world, who I just went to visit in the UK, who started a market garden. Just amazing, amazing little projects bringing up. So I, I was enjoying playing this role of kind of coming in and supporting where I could and seeing how they were developing, which was just really fun super fun to do yeah that's interesting i mean yeah of course like i feel like after you've done the production that hard for so many years you want to just kind of take a breather and get some perspective on it 
Yeah. And you, that moment you can stand back, you do, you start to realize a whole lot of things that that you, you didn't necessarily see when you were in the middle of things. Um, and I, it, do you have examples of that? Yeah. Well, I kind of wish it was a blessing on most farmers, you know, that they could literally just press a pause button and have a, you know, have a sabbatical year and step away and, and then be able to look back and, and, and see all those things that they'd want to change. So I've actually had that feedback from a few farmers just kind of <laughs> being kind of jealous that, I, that I, I'm lucky enough to make <laughs> this, this role, um, which on the other side, I sometimes feel super guilty visiting farmers, you know, when they're in peak production and there I am just looking well slept, very relaxed, <laughs> <laughs> terribly guilty. Right. Some, yeah. What are some of those things? One, look, one which keeps coming up all the time is just um, whenever I'm visiting farms, I can, I can actually link it in that one of the things that I'm focusing my energy on as well is that I, I applied for a, a research scholarship through a an organization called Nuffield, um, which is a world organization that operates a number of countries, UK, Japan, Netherlands, Cal- Canada, US, Brazil, it goes on. Um, and the organization's objective is to increase practical farming knowledge, management, skills, techniques, et cetera, across agriculture industries. And it does that by basically supporting farmers like myself to travel abroad, to research, tour and meet farmers. So a lot of what I've also been doing over the past six months after leaving and receiving the scholarship was to start visiting farms and that kind of, that played at that juxtaposition. So whilst visiting farms and asking those questions enabled me to start having that, that pause moment to, to look objectively at how I was farming um, and start analyzing, okay, this guy's doing it this way. I did it this way. What, where are the crossovers? Where are the benefits? And, um, that's been, yeah, that's been really interesting, really interesting. So was that part of the proposal that you, did you have like a specific goal for that proposal with your, with this scholarship or was it kind of a broad go? Like, how does that, how does that work with enough field? So one is the first thing is to really encourage other farmers listening to, to go in for it. I think traditionally, <clears throat> traditionally the actually organization has funded a lot more of their larger larger commercial farms and i think a part of it is just because the small farming sector hasn't actually reached out so as i said there's a long list of countries us being one of them where um nuffield is is operating and i basically yeah went to them and, and pitched them and i basically pitched the idea that i wanted to research the design of intensive production systems um, for small scale farms and how they can drive and increase productivity and profitability. So in other words, I wanted to explore the key pivotal elements of small scale farming, which we might utilize to increase productivity, profitability, and overall success. So it's a broad research topic, but they were super supportive because I think basically the small scale farming industry is, is, and the movement is, is taken off. It's taken off in the US. It's starting to take off in Australia and it's being it's being noticed by by industries. You know, there's there are, there are suddenly supermarket chains that are becoming interested in what does it mean to be supporting or purchasing from small growers, local growers. Um, there's there's obviously research industries. So part of my funding was by Hort Innovation, which is an Australian um, research body as well. And they were obviously super interested in understanding what role the small scale farming scene can have on the economy, on local communities. So that was essentially going, pitching the idea, um, working through and then being accepted for it, which is, um, which is a big surprise because I said most, most of the people are, are in larger, larger farming conditions, but they've been unbelievably supportive of, of what I'm interested in researching so I could really encourage other people to, to, to check that out because it's an amazing funding opportunity and also on their website. So if you go into Nuffield, whether it's whether for Australia or Nuffield International, all the researchers, once they come back, put online their research and there's some incredible wealth of knowledge at everyone's fingertips relating to every topic you can imagine in, term, in, in terms of the ag industry, whether it's horticulture through to dairy and whatnot. And that's all freely available? That's not... Yeah, completely freely available. A uh, part of the exactly they they're as I said, like for the the Australian the Nuffield Australia, a part of it is about um sending Australian farmers or whether that organization is overseas to bring that international knowledge back to their home countries and then disseminate it. So there is just a bulk of knowledge and because 
there's so much international cross-pollination going on, it's amazing to tap into that different knowledge and how it does apply in different condition, contexts, economies, so forth. That's great. Okay, great. Yeah, I mean, that's a that's an excellent resource then. Um, one of the things you've been doing is you've, you've, you're now in Israel and you are, have been working and visiting some of these farms. Can you, I, I don't know much about the Israeli farm scene and I'm curious if you can kind of give us a rundown of what you're seeing there, like maybe describe that climate a bit first, but then also talk about like what the agriculture is like. So disclaimer is that obviously the disclaimer is that I'm, I'm obviously no professional. This is, you know, this is me living in the country for a number of years previously and also coming and visiting places, but, um, it's a pretty incredible place in terms of its its agriculture. It's a very tiny country, so there's a lot of um, progress in terms of technology and intensive production because farming real estate is obviously very, very, very short. There's not a lot of it. So it's about how do you essentially ex- grow or extract. There's definitely often you know that commercial extractive mindset. What can we extract from a, a small small amount of land. So I've obviously focused most of my attention on in the organic space, but in terms of ag technology, it's it's pretty incredible here. Like I always said, you know, when in the small scale movement when there was often a lot of developments in terms of greenhouse growing and um, you know, with tomatoes, cucumbers, eggplants and whatnot, that that was some of the stuff that I was seeing already seven, eight years ago, nine years ago, just, you know, before I was even too into farming, seeing some incredibly progressive farms in terms of um, their high, um, their intensive production. So as I said, I've been just lucky enough to cruise around and, and visit some operations, not as many as I want, but um, it's just an incredible, incredible place. So in terms of climate, it's very, it, it varies. So you've got a lot of it is a, a Mediterranean climate. So some wet, cold winters for a very short amount of time, which is most of the rainfall over, uh, over you know, three, three and a half, four months. And then the rest of the year, it starts to basically progressively get hotter and drier. Um, and Israel itself is, you know, probably over getting close to two thirds is an arid desert climate where a lot of actually the horticulture is grown. And that's why, no surprise, things like um, drip irrigation was developed a lot of a lot more irrigation technologies came out of Israel because of limited resources so poor quality soils in the desert not a lot of rain so an incredible amount of technology coming to support horticulture so down in that southern part where I was spending time for a while there's just a mind-boggling amount of red peppers being grown cucumbers eggplants tomatoes um and they're growing over in the Israeli winter down south. So while up north, there's a lot less of that being produced in many areas because it just gets too cold. Um, down south, you can be visiting and uh, middle of the middle of the winter, and you've just got hectares of hectares of hectares of of just pumping out produce, which for me was absolutely mind blowing. Do you have any specific innovations that you feel like really stand out? I mean, you talked about the irrigation and stuff, but is there anything that you that coming up from Australia and looking around, did you see anything that really popped up for you for having spent four years, you know, the last four years at Mossy Willow and in intensive production that you feel like, man, if I'd known that <laughs> or if I'd seen that or if I had that technology, that would have changed some things? Well, that's a great question. And it's something I'd also I'll, I'll shoot back to you. When I when I first when I first received the the funding for the research, I had this initial kind of, maybe I'll call it a boyish kind of drive to to explore the world of, of technology and tools. I was like, oh my God, I've just got to, I've got to, the answer to increase productivity has to be in the technology. So I was like, all right, bang, Japan is on my list to visit. They've got compact tractors and they've got these mini harvesters and mini carts and electric planters and the list goes on. And then I was like, oh, I've got to get my way to Holland, high tech greenhouses, robotics, precision tractors you know, GPS, software, mapping, drones, the list goes on. And I was like, if only, you know, maybe the small scale farming movement could co-opt some of this stuff. And that's a separate conversation. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it as well. That's where my initial kind of pull was um, in terms of the answers to increasing, you know, production and productivity has to be there. And, and since I'm, I'm not sure that's, I'm not sure that's, that's the whole, that's kind of the full answer or the pull of my research at the moment. So whilst, 
you know, I I haven't because I've actually I haven't visited those two places yet. You know, Japan and Holland. Um, I haven't stumbled across a lot of the crazy high tech stuff, which is definitely circulating in a lot of a lot of research articles and um and, and such. But I'm I'm questioning whether that that's where the answers lie. What are your, what are your thoughts on that? I think that's an interesting point. Like I I I think everybody gets excited about a new tool or a new idea that comes out and they think that's going to be the answer and it generally doesn't turn out that way. Um, sometimes it does. Sometimes it works out really well. I, I mean, I think the paper pot transplanter is a great example of that. It, it's one that has saved a lot of people a lot of time, but a lot of people have been like, this just doesn't fit my system. Um, you know, it's expensive, uh, you know, whatever, whatever their reasons are, it just doesn't really fit into their system. So it hasn't, it, you know, I don't know that we're ever going to see that, that like complete farming game changer, um, for everyone. I think it's never going to be, there's never going to be able to be that broad stroke, but yeah, I think that's an interesting, I mean, yeah, I certainly go through periods where I see that pull of like, Oh, if I just had this thing, um, and maybe that's like currently my, my fixation is the living pathways. So I'm always kind of looking for that tool. That's going to make that even more efficient, uh, the management of those, but I don't think that tool necessarily exists yet. But I think when it does exist, it's not just going to solve all the issues right away. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I think that, you know, it's it's more nuanced than just it's not often in the tools. It's often in the management and in the planning. Uh, you know, success isn't to be to be clear. Success isn't in the tools. It's in the planning. It's in the, um, you know, the execution, the management, the the soil quality, the water delivery, all of those things. Um, I think those are in general, more important than any specific tool or, or specific innovation. But there are like, it's like, you know, there are little things that I, I would love, like I would love to go to Holland and uh, the Netherlands and go visit some of these really intensive horticultural uh, experiments and see, see like what I can glean, if anything, and if only in like to- pruning techniques and, you know, maybe nutrient delivery or anything like that. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I get that bug sometimes. And I think it's legit. I think I think it's a legitimate bug. I was, you know, when I started doing the research, I subscribed to a, a horticulture research paper that's based on some really high end techie greenhouses, and there was one article that popped up from a an experienced grower in Holland of you know thirty plus years consulting, and he basically said that you know algorithms are the future, hmm. basically saying that we're, we're getting to the point now where the, the it's the 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 qualities in the, you know, those small details and those details are beyond human capacity to make those judgment calls. And the future is going to be in, as I said, it's going to be in algorithms and technology and software, which I think is super interesting. Um, but maybe like we're saying, it's, it's, it's a part, it's definitely a part. And I, I, I agree with you, you know, exactly when all these, you know, paper pot came out and, you know, different cedars it can take an edge off and really make production possibilities you know it make, makes things easier production possible but from most of the places that i've visited so far in australia in israel and in the uk over and over again you hit the nail on the head it just came it comes down less to kind of the technical growing side of managing a farm and it comes down to the human the human management and that side of the farm, which seems to be a, a massive lack in in the efficiency and productivity of a lot of a lot of farms, right? And when you're talking about human management, you're not just talking about the farmer, but also like staff. And can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. So exa- exactly that. Just you know, the, the the thing, the human management angle is involving whether you know clear communication within a team, managing the overall human resources, training staff, allocating. St- tasks and giving instructions you know managing motivation team dynamics that's that's a massive area that that comes up often um whether straight away to the surface or you know just digging a little bit and looking around asking some questions that seems to be coming up as as something which a lot of um they're the, they're the soft skills i think which they, they haven't been at the forefront of a lot of you know, training conversations around what does it mean to be a farmer? What does it mean to manage a farm? Most of that is on the technical side of growing. So that's definitely been coming out. And then the other side is obviously, yeah, I think the the management of processes and protocols, um, 
you know, which came, which been on the forefront for a while now. And, you know, after Ben Hartman brought out, you know, the lean, the lean farming, the book, um, and there's been a lot more conversations around the importance of those, those other elements of farming, not just the technical side, but they seem to be, you know, if there was a pie chart of where we could improve to make the biggest amount of impact, it seems less important for me to kind of pull out a little tool here and a little tool there or software, but kind of fleshing out those other elements of farming that I think a lot more small-scale farms could be investing their energy in to sharpen up. And I think those impacts would be quite substantial on their farms. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, I think that the employee management and employee happiness uh, side of this job, of this career of, of running a farm business is it's so interesting and so important and so underexplored, I feel like, um, that, you know, Hannah and I have been, we have one employee and we hope, but we do hope to expand that and have more employees over the, you know, uh, over in the future. So we have one full-time employee at the moment, but this, you know, we are trying to think of all the nuanced elements of having an employee and making sure they're okay and that they're not working too hard in the sun and it's too hot or, you know, the little things, uh, like making sure that they know where the bathroom is and they have full access to it and that they're comfortable there. They know they can stop and get, take a break. They know they can get water whenever they need to. They know those sorts of little parts of it. Like that's what we really are trying to flesh out now. So that in the future, when we bring on more employees that we're prepared for all of those things and making sure that, um, you know, that they're comfortable and that they're, uh, but that also their work is effective, that everybody is happy doing what they're doing, but that also they're in the right place at the right time. And, um, that we're adding value to the farm and all of those things and that they understand and have a sense of propriety about it. So it's a, it's a big element of it that I had not given enough consideration to uh, until the last couple of years. Completely. And I, I, well, I think, and even to, to complement what you're saying in terms of all the things you just said in relation to a staff or a team member, I think sometimes we forget to apply it to ourselves as either a sole farmer or farming in a partnership with a significant other or, or whoever. Um, we kind of feel like when we take the step into having staff, that's when it becomes serious about, okay, I've, I've got to get, I've got to have my protocols down. I've got to make sure when's appropriate to do that. How do I do that? How do I maximize the time here? How do I nourish, how do I nourish my staff and make sure they're happy? But I visited, I visited, you know, farmers who are running solo operations who have not had nearly enough fleshed out protocols around, all right, let's, let's maximize our time. Let's have a schedule about when we're starting, when we're finishing, what are my tasks for the day? Um, when am I doing all these different things? I think that self-management often gets swept under the carpet when you're a sole operator um, because you're dealing with yourself. Yeah. And self-motivation can be really tough and like keeping yourself on task. And, uh, I, I mean, personally, I've found that podcasts are my like go-to if I have a podcast and I can just keep, keep rocking. But if I don't, if I, if, you know, if I'm not, if whatever reason I'm not listening to one that day, I get distracted really easily and I don't stay on task. <laughs> Uh, but I think also like, yeah, I mean, that's a really great point about self-management and managing, especially in solo operations, or like you said, and when it's you and your partner, um, you know, managing yourself is, is a, is an important place to start and think about. Cause is it, you know, I, I, I was talking to somebody, I think it was during one of our live conversations recently for growers live. Uh, somebody had asked just about that sort of idea and, or just about burnout in the summer is actually what we were talking about. And I was thinking about that. You know, you need to, when you're working, you need to work it, but then when you're not working, when work day is done, you need to stop. And those, because it makes you more efficient if you focus your energy on the work hours, like if you set specific work hours and you focus your energy on just getting what you need to get done during the day, you can stop and you can feel good about stopping and you can rest. That's been a big lesson for me. I know. I agree. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. And it's, it's about, yeah, it, and it's, it, it it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier, that idea of clear as kind. There's something about the clarity um, when you write something down, make it obvious, interact with it. Does it suit me? Does it fit me? If it does, then then it's it's there to be interacted with. But otherwise, as I said, yeah, you can easily – boundaries get pushed around before you know it. Yeah, it's, it's 10 o'clock at night and you've got the, the headlights on the tractor and you – I don't know what you're doing out there. Let's – I kind of want to keep with this – question of like some of the things you've seen and what you've sort of taken away from them 
so far. And I'm curious, like in terms of soil management, if there's anything or if there's any soils or anyone that's doing it really well that you kind of want to uh, highlight or that you really took a lot from? That's a great question. Um, someone that stands out that just was a, a, a great point of reflection um, was actually in the UK recently. I went to visit um, a farmer called Fred Price of uh, Gothenley Farm in uh, in the UK. And a part of, I think, a part of what I've really enjoyed about the Nuffield research is that because I have a cohort of about 15 other scholars in the same year, mo I think I'm the only I'm the only veggie grower. So the rest of the farmers are spread throughout. You know, they're they're in dairy, whether it be sheep or or cattle. We've got there's some cropping farmers, so growing grains, growing pulses. Um, there's cattle. It, it, the list goes on, and it's been one of the most uh, really enjoyable and challenging parts being a part of the community because I'd always really been inside my my kind of vegetable horticulture bubble and then suddenly reaching out and, and being a part of a cohort really has made me reflect upon farming. So when I went to the UK um, and started touring around um, with Kez and also a friend, Jesse, came along who we were visiting on, on Saliki Farm, Jesse suggested we reach out and, and, and check out this guy called Fred Price and we went out to visit him and he's, he's farming on doing some, you know, some broader acres, so a few hundred acres of, um, grows a lot of heritage grain, a lot of wheat, um, and is doing a lot of breeding work in wheat. Um, and also on the side, he also raises pasture-raised pigs um, and he's attempting to grow, or he does grow all their feed on his on his land. So he's growing these incredible mixed mixed pasture, um, and really experimenting as he's going along, um, in terms of you know what are the best mixes for his climate and his soil type, and he he then runs runs a, a tractor over, basically mills it up and has that for food, and then also you know he he puts the uh, the pigs out on that pasture afterwards. So he's had this amazing journey of the last um x many years of exploring soil development in his climate obviously um a mix between using livestock using grains and using cover crops to really build the soil and i what really was standing out to me is is i think that there was there's been an old one of the old ways of maintaining fertility on farms was through long-term rotations be it through grains going back to pasture grazing and then it would be cropped through vegetables for a number of years and it was incredible being on the site and seeing these large large fields that had been under some pretty amazing diverse cover crops um and then working them in and what i was reflecting on it was one is experimenting in the role that animals and livestock can have um in creating fertility on our farms and again i think there are a lot of biodynamic farms at least in a, a, you know various parts of europe and i know in australia that do that as well in the, in the states where that is a part of their fertility system for developing their soils, but I was I was just really blown away by the scale of it. You know, when you're on this, in, when you're farming intensively on a small amount of land, and you're bringing in composts and fertility from the outside, and really trying to alter or improve a soil type, it's it's humbling. It was humbling visiting uh, the, the, visiting Fred Price and kind of seeing. Um, the scale or that goes the scale of basically how do you how do you alter and improve tens and hundreds of acres of land through just cover cropping and then bringing in livestock and for me it was it was amazing it was amazing to see that slow progression it's not as intense as as I'm saying on a farm on an intensive vegetable farm where you're bringing in those inputs from the outside here was this incredible dynamic process of of animals microbes fungi working in, in some of a natural way and there was there was some light tillage that was going in into that but that was also an interesting point to reflect upon it, it was scale in terms of scale and impact of the work that we do as farmers and and ecological farmers sometimes it's exciting well, for me it's, it's exciting sometimes visiting these larger operations who are managing to ameliorate soils and rehabilitate soils on a much larger scale than we do on these small ones and, and what technologies and techniques do they use so that was that really stood out to me as something I'm, I'm i'm sitting on as a as a potential practice for the future if i was the owner of enough acreage to do something like that right yeah i think a lot i mean people ask me a lot about 
animal integration. And it's really tough in a small scale intensive vegetable production system because let's say, you know, when I, I had sheep for many years and we love sheep, I, I've always enjoyed them. We uh, sold them when we moved to our new farm because it wasn't going to make sense on our new farm. We didn't ha- quite have enough acreage to really make it make sense. And it didn't really make sense on our old farm. There was no profitability there. I just enjoyed them. Um, but I would occasionally let them graze our, you know, cover crops and that sort of thing. But the reality is our beds were too loose and the sheep would sink and we would end up with compaction. Even if we moved them in and out really quickly, it was just not, it, it was not super functional. And then, you know, not only are we organic, but so we have to wait a certain amount of time before we can plant into those beds um, after manure comes through. But also, you know, just in terms of food safety, it was kind of iffy at times. So people ask me a lot about that. And I, I, I don't know that there's a really good answer on a small scale. Like broad acreage seems like the one place that you can, you know, in grain production, but you could do it in vegetables or whatever it is. But, you, you know, those kind of strong, long uh, rotations like that, I think are kind of the only way that really works, like what Gabe Brown is doing and like what you're describing there. Yeah. Sometimes I've, I've also been exploring that idea of maybe, you know, the, the role of intensive farming and extensive farming on the same property. I know there's definitely, there's, there's, there are crops that really tend to suit the intensive production that we do because obviously through some of the practices that you're exploring on the show, no-till practices reduce weed production it's easy to, to maintain fertility in the way we do it. It's intensive, so you're maximizing your real estate. It's easy to manage. But there's also a number of crops that really that really suit more extensive growing on on slightly larger acreage. I'm not even talking about on, you know, hundreds of acres, in, you know, whether it's being five or ten acres growing larger crops, where it be it, you know, spuds or corn, pumpkins, et cetera, which don't often make it into the small scale farm in the quantities that I think also the consumers desire. So it's interesting to kind of flirt with that idea because I, I do agree there's some part of me that's kind of like, oh, my God, bringing livestock into an intensive production doesn't work for the way I really enjoy farming. But if I had that intensive production and had another area which was more for extensive production of certain crops, I'm excited about that idea. I think that's great. I mean, that that sort of side of it, I well, for one, I love growing things like potatoes and corn, and I never really have enough space to grow it on any sort of scale. Um but I enjoy that. And I think, yeah, I mean, it would probably be a matter of, you know, separating those two sides of having an intensive production plot and then having something that's more extensive, like you're talking about, um, in order to really integrate animals if you wanted to. Like we do, we don't necessarily do it that way, but we have an intensive plot uh, that is, you know, year round production, vegetable production, not a lot of cover cropping and those sorts of things, more Im- importing co- compost and making our own. And then, we're also developing a four plot system with like cover crops that would be more extensive that are more for longer season stuff. So we want a cover crop, we want to kill it we want to plant into that. Um, and then that be maybe one, maybe two crops out of that per year, but very little work because we're really just the cover crop, the plant, the harvest we're done. And so that's kind of the idea there. And I think in a situation like that, you could see more animal integration. Yeah, definitely worthwhile exploring. And, and I think also a part of that, part of the reason why I started thinking about it a bit more in the UK was that I think the 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 crop lists or what what sells well changes according to the countries that you go to. So I know in the UK I was really um <clears throat> I was really kind of blown away by what they were growing there. So if you had a CSA, the staple crops in the UK are things like potatoes, leeks, pumpkins, carrots, swedes, Brussels sprouts, cabbages they're the things that people actually want on a more frequent basis in a, something like a csa which takes up a lot of real estate um when then when i was thinking about israel in israel they are just the biggest vegetable eaters i've ever come across it's incredible like you know the, the kohlrabi is is the opposite of a weird vegetable it's eaten by a lot of people <laughs> you go to a farmer's market and people picking up three or four bunches of parsley spring onions um dill all these faster crops to grow that really suit the intensive production means if you were running a CSA in this country, it feels like you could get away a lot more with basing on an intensive system. So I think when I was there, that was also conscious on my mind after being at a friend's farm and she was running a CSA and kind of seeing the challenges of running an intensive operation for a CSA when you don't have the space to grow these more extensive crops. 
Hey, you all just wanting to give a real quick shout out to our Patreon members. Patreon.com slash no till growers is the lifeblood of our work. And so we deeply appreciate each and every one of you who has signed up. And as a bonus at a certain level, or if you just bump up from one level to another, you get a shout out on the show. So big shout outs this week to Stephen Smith, Alberto Diaz, Scott, Ohio Roots, Scott Harris, Earth Care Farmer, Jane Murner Cynical, Asia Smith, Scott Snodgrass, Andrew and Haley Keeler of Avoda Sustainable Acres, Jay Mill, Tony Lopez, Thomas Eliason, Judson Taylor, John Mills, Grown Up Farms, Jacob Arthur, Clara Coleman, Wild Mountain Seeds, Bob and Ann Patton of Hexhamshire Organics, Jared Kirst, Jay Armour, Dan Brisebois, C. Max Small, Jay McCombs, Tim Baldwin, Marc Andre Giroux, Esoterra Culinary, Steve Larson, Jean Martin Fortier, Yannick Laplante, Jen Lawrence, Darren Rose, Francesca Zito, Bob F. D. Payne, Easton Richmond, and Amy Broadbeck Linhart. Thank you to everyone who supports us however you can. Even just sharing our work is huge. All right, back to Mikey. You you mentioned markets there for a second. I'm curious if you could talk about some of the things you've seen at the markets uh, outside of Australia that you felt like were different or interesting or even just kind of changed your perspective on farmers markets in general? Um, for sure. One, one, any, everyone listening, I have a, I, I have an Instagram account that I've been f- basically uploading for my own research sake, all the, all the stuff that I've been, you know, taking photographs of, of, or people I've been chatting with. So a lot of the stuff I'm sharing today, you can kind of get some good, a good idea of, uh, you can basically get a visual of that stuff. And definitely one of the things I've enjoyed the most is obviously visiting some of the markets in Israel. Um, not not all of them. In fact, a lot of them actually aren't the growers' markets. So there there are, there are a lot of local reseller markets um, where you know a, a storeholder might bring you know ten percent of what they grow, and then the rest they're basically bought in. But I I just find you know one there's a very different energy. There's a there's like a a real hustle that goes on at least in Israel compared to what I've seen in Australia. There's a big kind of that Mediterranean vibe of there's a big energy. Um, and I've just loved seeing some of the produce. So there's, you know, there's a big pickling culture over here of, of certain crops. So they've had very small, very small eggplants. Um, you often see, as I said, you see kohlrabi often around the place. Um, baby lettuce is not a big thing over here. So you see a lot of a lot of head lettuces um, get grown. Um, tomatoes are just like you. Tomatoes are eaten all season long. So cherry tomato you know production of varieties of cherry cherry tomatoes over here is incredible um which also puts in puts into into question the idea of what is seasonal local food because in a small country like israel essentially you know i but in australia in australia you know when you're talking about seasonal food even inside victoria where i come from you know there are there are local growers who are driving three hours to a market um when i think about israel three hours is crossing the country and in winter, where there are areas of the country you can't grow tomatoes in the winter, down south you can. So it's a very interesting concept of, of seasonality because, as I said, there, there are crops are basically available all year round um, and of a really high quality. So going to visit those markets in the winter kind of kind of threw me out because, again, I was seeing all these summer crops, which I'm used to. And technically, are they seasonal? I, I'm, you know, it's a, it's a hard question to answer. Right. I, I'm glad you mentioned your Instagram too, because I've really enjoyed following all the different places that you've visited. There's you've done you've done a lot with fruit, which I think is really interesting. There seems like there's a big fruit culture there. Fruit, yeah, I hold it like the yeah the fruit over here is incredible. One thing one thing that's blown me away, as I said, just in terms of in backyards, people just have an abundance of fruit. I went to visit a, a mate, and I was hanging out in his garden, throwing a throwing a ball to his dog, and I looked up, and I was I literally was I stopped my tracks. He had he had a lemon, a pomegranate. Uh, a Brazilian cherry, macadamia, mangoes, lychees, olives, grapes, and this was in this tiny backyard. And I, I've just seen this across the whole country. So in terms of even just like home production, you know, they might not be the most well kept trees or looked after, but there's this culture here of just fruit trees everywhere. There's a you know there's a fig and an olive on every corner. Um, and, and in terms of the rest of the country, in terms of production, you know, you can't drive five minutes in this, in this country without seeing um, an array of Mediterranean crops, as I said before, figs, grapes, pomegranates and whatnot. But 
um, as I've obviously I've just learned over here in the Mediterranean cr- climate, if you add irrigation, you can essentially grow tropical crops. So across the whole country, you have bananas, um, avocados, man- mangoes, lychee, and so forth. So when I first arrived, I, I spent some time down in the desert working on a. I was actually in the desert, so I was away from that more Mediterranean climate. I was down into more of the arid region, and I spent a good three months on a on a date, on an organic date farm, which was a wild experience. Being in, suddenly an organic vegetable farmer turned um, date, organic date farmer for three months, which was mind blowing. It was uh, it was a relatively small date plantation. It was two and a half thousand trees. Um, and you spend the entire day from literally the moment you rock up to work until you finish in a in a cherry picker. So it's kind of like a, I don't know if you call them cherry pickers in the States, but basically like a crane that brings you up to up to the tree, it clamps around the tree and you've you got a platform and then you, you leave the platform, you climb into the tree and you spend hours in the canopy of these date palms um, just thinning fruit, pruning, and then moving on to the next one. So that was a that was a an amazing experience because I never worked in kind of, even though it was organic, it was an organic monoculture. I never worked in kind of a monoculture system and found it actually quite challenging in the, in the early stages. Um, but just blown away by, by the scale of these operations and, and how different farming is, you know, in, in different industries. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, I want to skip back to market for a second. Cause one thing I've noticed at the farmer's market is I feel like no matter where somebody comes from, you know, except for maybe Canada or something. Uh, but anytime somebody comes from outside of the United States, they often balk at our prices. And I was wondering, like, when you look at the market prices there, are you, are they competitive? Are they, do they seem low to you? Like, what is your feeling there? I think the UK things are generally quite, uh, it's similar pricing. Um, it's kind of hard getting my head around that thing, around the kind of the cost of production over there, just in terms of labour. In the pound is such a strong, such a strong currency that you, you know people are selling things for one or two pounds, which kind of takes you as a shock, just as a numer- numerical figure. You used to think things in the threes and the fours. Mm-hmm. Um, Israel in itself, um, vegetable production is quite. It's it's seen as kind of a like it's it's a it's a big staple. Like people eat that many vegetables that people balk. They really do kind of widen their eyes at prices if they don't meet a certain minimum. Organic over here is quite is quite expensive um, in comparison to to your your conventional production. Um, so I don't know. It's it's yeah. I, I I do generally think that conventional food over here is quite cheap for like tomatoes. Like you can get a a half kilo. They sell they sell cherry tomatoes by the half kilo or kilo, which is mind blowing because that price of a kilo of cherry cherry tomatoes back in australia organic is that's 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 expensive <laughs> so yeah i i i just always think that's interesting because i think like different cultures obviously have different perspectives on food especially people especially cultures probably that eat an enormous amount of vegetables probably you know are really trying to make sure that their their the price makes sense for them um in their household and in their budget and when they get to the United States, where we don't have that strong of a vegetable culture, at least not yet. I mean, we have a growing, it feels like growing, you know, uh, culture around farmers markets um, in buying fresh vegetables. But the, the the price, not only of production, but of, of the purchase for the customer is, um, you know, often tends to be high in their eyes. And I've always wondered, like, what drives that? That's I, I don't know. I'm not sure, but I, I definitely know that there's something about cultural cultural cuisines that has a role to play um as i said there's there's something about the food culture over here that people just love cooking love just like you know the 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 breakfast like the the, the more traditional breakfast you have over here like when we were we were farming down in that that community down the desert where i was in the date farms the breakfast there was literally you'd sit down there'd be a couple of pieces of nice bread be some hard-boiled eggs and it'd be a, a massive platter of vegetables and everyone would just make their own salad with you know people are eating raw spring onions kohlrabi chopped up beetroots crunching into it like it was you know the best day of the week um and i think that that contributes i think to it it's like you're saying that there, there might be a culture of farmers markets but there's something about uh, an entire culture coming together around around food that definitely has to do with maybe affecting affecting obviously the way people interact with it but potentially the cost as well 
Yeah. Yeah. And I also get really excited when they do decide to purchase my produce because I feel like they chose it and they, they approved of the quality, uh, no matter where they come from, if they're balking at the price, but they decide ultimately it's worth it. That's exciting for me. I feel like that's a win. Absolutely. Win. Absolutely. A win. Um, so, all right. So I don't, I don't know exactly how to segue with this, but we've got an exciting collaboration coming up on a new project and that's kind of why we decided to do this interview. And I'm also, um, really excited about it. So, but I thought we could have you introduce it a little bit and talk about what you've been up to and what folks can maybe expect from it. Yeah. So, well, the, the exciting news is that I, I've, I've come on to, to, to join you guys because I've been a, a a listener of the no-till farming podcast for a long time um, and have enjoyed so much the content i've learned a huge amount and when you yeah when you put the call out for potentially exploring what would no-till growers look like in the southern hemisphere um a friend uh, kind of shot me about it and i was like hey I'd, I'd i'd love to get on board so super exciting to be working on that project with you um and a part of the, a massive part of the excitement of, of joining and, and running a this I think no till no till growers market garden for the southern hemisphere is that there is an incredible amount of growers that don't get the attention that are farming every single day that have incredible innovations they're farming in a very different climate out in Australia so Australian climate blows me away you know depending on where you are you can be in an arid climate a cool temperate a Mediterranean subtropical and the far north Queensland, you're in a you're in a tropical climate where you know bananas bananas are growing in people's back doors. So I was really excited to have the opportunity to to reach out to a lot of growers who have been inspirations for me over the last X many years, um, farmers from all different styles, um, scales, and you know and and scopes, and to reach out to them and to to bring them into the show and and to ask them those questions because. As what you and I have been exploring now, Jesse, um, over the last six months, there's been a lot of things knocking at my door, making me reflect on all sorts of things, whether that be, as I said, management has been a really, really important thing. Um, scale has been a consideration. I've been exploring different farms, different scales. Scope, so economies of scope and diversity is something which has come up a lot in my my travels, certainly in the UK, a lot of really exciting conversations around diversity and collaborations between farms in terms of what they grow and how they grow it together. So I'm really excited to be chatting with these Australian farmers and New Zealand farmers and to really see how how all these systems that they've been using, you know, can benefit. And I, I think I think the audience everybody's gonna get a lot out of it. I agree. And it bring like I've listened to the first few episodes and and doing i'm doing the editing and um there's a different perspective there and i don't want to give too much away because i think it's 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 going to be enriching for the uh you know to to like you said to anyone anywhere um but i'm very excited for this perspective because it's something that we haven't been able to explore enough from our from the united states and i just don't have enough uh perspective on it i've not been in that area uh, to be able to ask the right questions and know what the the focus for people in the Southern Hemisphere would be, uh, specifically in Australia and New Zealand. And um, I'm, I'm just so excited, Nike. I think you've done a great job from, you know, the the interviews that I've heard so far have been so wonderful. And, and, and you bring such a thoughtful uh, perspective to the interview itself. And um, so that will, you know, we'll give more details on this, but that'll run for the next uh, 10 or so weeks. And then, you know, we'll go straight into the no till market garden podcast. Um, but I'm, it's going to be an amazing aperitif to that. And I'm, uh, yeah, I'm so excited that you were willing to jump on with us. Yeah. And, and so as a, yeah, so thanks for the opportunity and also so humbling. A lot of the growers that I get to have a chat with, um, I've just been literally following and, and messaging for so many years to be able to have an opportunity to kind of say, Hey, can I, can I ask about these questions? And, like you said, uh, as much as we've we've learned so much from the Northern Hemisphere, and I've just had such a ball asking a whole lot of questions, getting challenged on a whole lot of ideas that I thought were, you know, that that I held true, and really exciting, touching upon different people in different climates. There's um there's some really interesting stuff that comes out when we start exploring, yeah, all the different growing land, the landscapes and um what people grow. So, yeah, really really excited. Thanks for thanks for reaching out and and uh, and, and partnering up. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I completely know that feeling of I'm, I'm a super fan of everybody I interview and it, I, I'm like starstruck every time. And it's because these are, this is what the goal was kind of from the beginning to be able to bring those ideas out and talk to the people, um, who I've been looking up to and who've informed me for so many years and be able to share that information. Um, I do want to do one more question before we let you go. Uh, I'm curious in terms of the next few years, like what is, you know, we've kind of been discussing like what you've been up to, but like, what is, what does the next few years look like? What are you hoping to kind of move into? So I, I've just been so super revved up over the last, you know, as I, I had that downtime after, after finishing up at the last farm and I've just been so filled by this program process of you know as i said on this project with you interviewing farmers and traveling around that yeah kez and i have just been really well we're both brimming brimming cups so we're um we're coming back to australia and the idea is to be really exploring with a couple of very close dear friends of ours who farmed with us um at mossy and the hope is to be, yeah, is to be, is to be farming together. Is to find a piece of land to really take some of the lessons that we're where we're learning along the collaborative farming podcast. So we're learning from there and challenging each other and discussing. And the idea is to come together and um, and farm, and farm and do it in a way which hopefully leverages some of the privileges that we have, um, to enable other young farmers to get onto the project with us. And we're also really excited about diversifying. So some of the farming friends may have started out in vegetable production with us but they're really broadening the horizons and getting excited about working with, with livestock. Kez is, is really pumped to be doing some work with, um, with livestock, with pastured chooks and kind of understanding how that can fit into the system. And, and Kez is such a managerial boss. She's just so good at what she does and really tight. She's getting really excited about that interplay between enterprises and how to manage staff and, and to see if there can be a crossover, not as two separate enterprises or three or four on a farm site, but is there a way of, diversifying jobs and tasks for each farmer so that you know that's really fulfilling that creativity of, of farming not just you know whether it's 70 80 percent of your time as a vegetable farmer but do getting those moments of you know 20 30 percent of your labor time in a week that gets to explore the other wonderful parts of what does it mean to grow a diverse diet so i am excited and um yeah i'm just excited to put it all together and try to map this out that's great and i'm excited to watch it um well mikey dinsham Thank you so much for joining me, and I'm so looking forward to starting the uh, the Southern Hemisphere series that we're up we're putting up this uh, starting next Monday. Awesome, mate! Thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for having me on, and um, uh, I'm really looking forward to it all. All right, if you enjoyed that episode with Mikey, just hang out. Because starting next week, there will be more episodes with Mikey at the helm this time, interviewing various growers from the Australia and New Zealand area about the topics that are highly important to them. And let me tell you, there is a ton of perspective coming your way that is highly valuable no matter where you live. So stay tuned on this podcast feed for that. And after Mikey's amazing series, the No-Till Market Garden podcast will start in earnest immediately after. If you all like this idea and like having another host with a different perspective, it could be a path to making the No-Till Market Garden podcast a year-round thing. So let me know your thoughts as Mikey's season progresses. Otherwise, make sure you are subscribed to this podcast wherever you are getting it and leave a review. But this week, all reviews must try to get some rest from time to time so as not to burn out. Big thanks, as always, to Jackson Roulette and Josh Satin for their help. Huge thanks to Willie Breeding for the theme music. Thanks, as always, to my amazing wife and the illustrator of the Living Soil Handbook, Hannah Crabtree, for all of her help and support. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you back here next week for the first episode of the No-Till Market Garden Podcast, Southern Hemisphere Edition. All right. Bye. Absolutely. And there's some, it's always easy being on the other side of it. I don't know why it works that way, because you, you end up having more more mic time or air time when you're being interviewed, but there's something very nerve wracking about interviewing. There is. It's weird.